Thank you. Thank you for, for coming to my session. And uh, yeah, bear with me after lunch. So let's, uh, let's get started. And first of all, why, why are we tracking? Why we have an interest in tracking experiments? Well, um, as, we, as we want to explore and understand uh, what is the impact of changing algorithms or data sets or parameters, we enter this loop where we have an hypothesis on what could work and, and, uh, and potentially can improve performance. Then we design uh, our model, we train our model, uh, we tune our parameters, and then we evaluate uh, what we built. And then um, we might decide to, to, to keep uh, repeating the process. And this is basically the experimentation process. And uh, along this journey, you keep tracking uh, to keep a feedback loop of what's happening, to see if you are improving or not. Uh, and um, uh, what kind of information uh, we might be interested in tracking? Well, here we see a big cloud of things that we might be interested in, in tracking. Uh, could be parameters, inputs, predictions, metrics, uh, uh, metadata about uh, who's training the model, who's evaluating the model, debugging information, code, configurations, environmental variables, um, anything that can uh, be associated to the performance uh, of, uh, of our modeling or uh, that can impact our experiments. And, uh, um, so the topic of this talk is about uh, why it is important uh, to experiment in an efficient way. So why it is it so important uh, to, to be able to experiment fast? Well, once, uh, once you are able to track um, really fast, you don't care that much anymore about performance. So you're not selecting anymore what, uh, what you might really want to track or not. You just more freely relax and start tracking more. Uh, which means uh, potentially you are uh, repeating less uh, computation because uh, you might already have tracked what you were interested in, so you don't need to just run things again. And uh, this also means that uh, you can iterate faster and experiment more. So at the end of the day, if tracking uh, becomes really fast, you just tend to track more and you are more efficient. Uh, and also the, the, the experience for, for, the, for the developer or researcher is, is also improving. And um, let's, now, let's now have a look at uh, how can we model uh, an experiment. So what is an experiment? And uh, we will then use this framework, this, this way of representing or thinking about experiments through, through the rest of the talk. Well, an experiment, we can model it as a collection of runs, uh, where each run is an instantiation of our, our experiment with certain inputs, some parameters. Here we see, uh, we see here on the bottom side, we have, uh, for example, a train evaluation procedure where given different inputs, we get different outputs, and this would, uh, be, would be represented by two runs in, uh, in this model. And uh, here we see an, ex an, ex an example of experiment. So let's say that we have a classification problem. We try out, uh, we want to, to evaluate or consider different classifiers and uh, dummy classifier, logistic regression, decision trees, and forest. Uh, now, we might also want to experiment with different data sets, right? And, uh, and you probably also want to, to, to see how good or how robust are uh, these models, these classifiers, uh, depend on, uh, uh, on the seed, so, uh, so that uh, yeah, performance is not just good, uh, you haven't been just lucky. So with just very, this very simple uh, uh, setup, we get to, to more than 100 configurations, with, which in, uh, in what we just uh, uh, saw would, uh, would be modeled uh, as uh, uh, 120 runs. And uh, so this is, of course, a, a very important problem, and there are very established uh, robust solutions to, to solve this problem. Here, uh, I, I captured uh, the last couple of days, I have, have updated the numbers. What is the market share of, of different uh, uh, solutions, these different frameworks for uh, experiment tracking? And we see that MLflow, weights and biases capture most of the market, 
Then we have uh, uh, Comet, Neptune, AIM, uh, and, and many others uh, that, I mean, things here don't add up to 100 because I, I run it a bit uh, up. Uh, but overall, uh, uh, these are the main players, and uh, yeah, MLflow, uh, weights and biases are, are basically the, the two most important ones. The others uh, are, are basically have a very marginal uh, uh, market share. The, the, somehow the limitation of these two, th this actually not, not two, but uh, all these frameworks uh, is uh, uh, the slowness and the limitation in what kind of information you can track. So by, by type limitations here, I mean, uh, uh, what uh, if we don't want to, to track just floats or binary blobs? What, what if uh, we, in, a, in our experiments we have dictionary slits or um, strings or, or timestamps, booleans, uh, numpy arrays or data frames? How can we track uh, all the richness of the, of the information we are producing in, through, your, uh, uh, through our experiments? Uh, and, uh, this is what, uh, uh, what triggered the, um, what, what inspired and, and triggered uh, the, the creation of the, this new uh, framework for experiment tracking and track, which uh, I invite you to try and, and give it a try and, and see if it, it might be a good fit for, for your experiments as well. And, uh, and uh, I, I will now show you a little example of, uh, of how ML track works and this, this, this is basically also how all the others, uh, um, how you can interact with all the other uh, frameworks we saw before. So more or less the interface might be slightly different, but uh, the steps uh, are very similar. So first of all, uh, we create a session to, to, to wherever we want to store our track information. And in this case, uh, we, we track it in a SQLite local database, but can be anywhere. And, uh, and then once we create a session, so once we decide where we want to store our track information, we create an experiment, which we call test. Once we have our experiment, we can add runs. And in this case, uh, we just add uh, a, a dummy run where we set uh, an, uh, an accuracy value to float. And uh, uh, once we are done uh, running our experiment, we might want to save the results uh, of what we tracked. So, and uh, and once uh, once you 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 persisted the the track information, uh, of course uh, you might be interested in uh, in querying it, in retrieving it for for later analysis, for comparing uh, uh, experimental results uh, through different experiments and so on. And uh, uh, yeah, um, if we store the data we tracked uh, in. Um, in a relational database like SQLite, uh, then we can also easily query it with SQL, for example. Or if it is a, a Postgres, it, it can also be used maybe by someone else in the team to, to populate a dashboard and so on. And uh, now that uh, we saw a bit uh, um, how overall, uh, how can we design experiments, which are the frameworks, uh, which uh, as we will see, uh, are some of the concerns or limitations of these frameworks. We are ready to, to experiment a bit and see um, how these different frameworks perform and, uh, and what makes them uh, fast and slow, which I think uh, is very interesting. And uh, we, will, uh, we will look uh, in particular at the speed of uh, tracking floats uh, or arrays of floats and uh, Pine instrument for, for profiling and uh, Let's get started, and we will see um, results about three categories of uh, um, what could be slow. So let's say that we want to start a new experiment, and we do our tracking. So how much time does it take to start tracking, actually? How much time does it take uh, the tracking process to, to, just kick up, uh, to, to just start? And uh, once we start tracking, how frequently can we track? our metadata, our um, performance uh, evaluations and metrics and so on. Of course, we want to be able to track as frequently as we want, right? And, uh, and once we can track as much as we want, uh, we, we, can t we, we, we might want to track uh, uh, also very large objects, objects so that we are not really restricted uh, in what kind of information uh, we are tracking. So ideally, we, st we, we start tracking really fast 
we, we track as frequently as we want and uh, objects uh, being tracked uh, as large as we want. So this would be the, the ideal scenario, right? And uh, let's have a look at uh, how these different frameworks um, compare, perform, and, and, uh, and how they look like. So first experiment, we, we try to uh, um, track just one to 10 floats. Okay, so here we see all the average results. And uh, that in, in this experiment, we basically track, uh, uh, we simulate an experiment where we have uh, just uh, one value uh, or 10 values uh, uh, with type float uh, being tracked. And uh, here on the left, si left side, we see this bar plot where, where uh, we see that the best performing uh, um, framework is Neptune, and the slowest is weights and biases, uh, taking uh, 1.6 seconds, just to, to start. And, uh, and here we see that it's 399 times slower than the fastest one. So this is how you can read this plot. And uh, yeah, okay, so from b between the, the slowest and fastest, there's a difference of 400 times, so it's pretty big. What makes it uh, so fast or so slow? Well, weights and biases uh, um, threading and IPC is, is quite slow in, in the way it is handled, and as we will see, um, threads and how locks are, are managed. And uh, the fastest is Neptune, which basically writes directly to the file system, so there's basically nothing uh, Neptune is doing. It's doing very little, this is why also it's very fast. So the, the least you do, the fastest you are. And um, in the case of, uh, of the others, uh, is either writing to, to the database or dealing with the database. MLflow, interestingly, uh, even if the database doesn't exist yet, uh, insists in doing a complete uh, alembic migration, which takes some time with all the um, schema changes. And here we see uh, an example of uh, what happens in, uh, in, um, if, we, if we inspect uh, with profile weights and biases, what's happening. So, uh, most of the time is actually weighted in a lock, uh, and then we have uh, uh, some uh, tracking on the weights and biases side, and, uh, which also is taking 8% of the time. So kind of slow if you keep repeating this, uh, this process. Let's say now that we just track one float, and we, we, and we track it uh, across 100 runs. So very simple experiment. We repeat it 100 times, and, uh, and for each experiment, we just track a float. Here, things are a bit different. So ML track becomes faster, uh, and, and I will explain why in a second. While uh, the worst performing ML flow and, and weights and biases uh, get very, very slow, uh, so slower than linear, so it starts to be exponentially slower as we add more runs. So if, you, if you, in your experiment uh, you have uh, a large number of runs, large number of configurations you want to test, it gets extremely slow, ML flow and weights and biases. And why is um, ML flow so slow? Well, uh, it, it depends, it relies uh, on the, uh, what is called the entity attribute value model, where basically for uh, every time you, you track value, it, you are basically interacting and appending rows in, uh, in different tables, which is quite expensive. So if, if you do it in, uh, sorry, I think I messed up. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption. So in, uh, actually in this experiment, what, uh, what we see, we increase the number of floats uh, between 100 and 100,000. And uh, so we have way more floats being tracked now. So one run, uh, high number of floats, and, and we see ML flow and uh, weights and biases uh, uh, still uh, slow, but ML flow is actually much slower now than, than all the others. Why is that? Well, as I mentioned, entity attribute value model, so every time you track something, it keeps adding uh, more, more records uh, to different tables, so it's very expensive. And uh, what, what is interesting here is that uh, either you, you, you batch inserts or, or you keep inserting, uh, inserting or, or tracking at the individual um, data point, uh, which means uh, either streaming or, or batching uh, tracking. So depending on the, your use, use case, you might prefer uh, one way or the other. And uh, 
another difference here is, uh, uh, so if we go back one slide, so what makes XAML track so fast in this case is the fact that it's, uh, it's writing to, 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 um, to an SQLite database, which is much faster than writing to a file system. This is actually a screenshot from, uh, an SQLite, uh, from the SQLite uh, website describing uh, how this is possible. So open and closed system calls are very slow, and if you write, uh, if you let uh, SQLite handle uh, the, the single uh, uh, file on file system with all the data, it's gonna be much faster than, than uh, just uh, directly writing uh, maybe potentially smaller files more frequently. Let's, uh, let's now try to track one million floats and see what happens. Well, in this case, uh, uh, Western bias is uh, uh, still quite slow, 2.4 seconds. ML flow follows, aim follows. I mean, the, the, the um, ordering of the different frameworks uh, now remains pretty much uh, the same as before. And uh, how can ML track be so much faster than the others? Or, or at least uh, than, the, um, than the, the worst performing? Well, it is relying on, uh, on a safe subset of the pickle op, op codes uh, plus the NumPy um, native serialization, uh, which is very efficient. So uh, compared to the others that basically write either JSON or, or binary blobs, because they don't actually support uh, much more else. And, and in this way, you really lose uh, semantics. So it, it becomes, uh, you have all the kinds of problems which don't really relate to, to time performance, but uh, uh, this is also interesting to, to highlight. So a few words about safe pickling um, and, and why I think it's quite interesting. So usually you hear that pickling is not great because it's unsafe or it's not very portable, but if you restrict uh, uh, the pickle opcodes to, to the ones that are just safe, so for example, you can construct uh, lists uh, scalars like floats, uh, integers, and, and, and many others, um, without really uh, incurring in any dangerous opcode, uh, which is quite good. And uh, if you fix uh, the, the, if you decide on, on which pickle version you want to use, it's quite portable across different, uh, different platforms, which uh, is quite nice. And you don't really need to add uh, more uh, performant, uh, custom packaging or, or packages or, or, um, or formats, you, you can just rely on what is already there. It's already super efficient. Uh, no need to add more. Let's now, uh, and here we see uh, just that point, uh, what happens if we try to, to write one billion uh, bytes here in the eight? And here, where the, the other frameworks basically can, cannot really reach this performance anymore. Uh, they just get too slow. So here we see how, how things perform uh, with ML truck, uh, different versions of, of uh, how you can actually store the, the data being tracked. What we see here, uh, three versions. Either uh, we write directly to the file system, which is, uh, of course, uh, the fastest, and uh, uh, without, uh, without relying on, uh, on w w without the overhead of SQLite. MLTrack FS, and then we have MLTrack TB mem, where we basically uh, have an SQLite database, but in memory. So we do have uh, all the, the the fancy properties, or, or, or we have all the capabilities of having a database in memory, so we can query actually the database very easily. Uh, but we are not really writing to the file system. And lastly, we have an SQLite file stored in the file system. As we see. As we, as we increase uh, the, the size of the array we, we are tracking, the, uh, the database, the file system, uh, the SQLite database stored in the file system gets pretty slow. Still, uh, uh, if, if instead of writing to the file system, you just uh, keep your database in memory, it's pretty fast. Uh, it's pretty fast, SQLite. Uh, not that, uh, that much slower than writing directly to the file system. So, but still, uh, if you just uh, write to the file system, could be, could be even faster. Then, of course, it depends uh, what, uh, how easy then uh, you, you want to be able to, to process and access the data you just tracked. 
And uh, um, yeah, so a few conclusions here. So threading uh, IPC, which one is better? It really depends on, on how you are uh, on how you are handling uh, your um, your uh, communication uh, either with uh, with threading or the, uh, distinct processes, and how you are interacting, how you are then able to impact on. Oops, sorry, uh, it impacts how you can actually then query or, or insert uh, the track information. Is it a web API like uh, with and biases, or you have uh, that connection to a database, so you're not really relying on uh, um, custom integrations or, or, or um, um, yeah, custom uh, integrations. Then you can also decide batching streaming, which one is uh, the kind of tracking is might be a good for, fit for you. And uh, as we saw, uh, native SQL types, Python types, PRO, uh, open formats, are all we need to, to have very performant tracking. We don't need any more UN encoding or JSON like formats, which are kind of slow and they, they don't really much, they don't offer rich semantics on what you just tracked. And, uh, and what I showed you, so this presentation uh, uh, impacted, uh, uh, so what is the impact of this presentation or, or this study, uh, this, uh, this project I'm at track? Besides, uh, um, Besides providing uh, uh, value on its own in a, in a kind of unique way, uh, it already brought to, to, to the surface, at least for weights and biases, some performance uh, issues that uh, are being uh, solved uh, in the latest version of the SDK. So happy to say that uh, this project indirectly contributed a bit to, to increase uh, significantly the performance of weights and biases tracking. And uh, with this, um, I'm very happy uh, to conclude and answer any questions. Thank you.